Hey, Retcon Raider here. Today's video is dedicated to Draketh and Revenant. Thanks for your support, guys. That said, let's get started. Welcome back to Stygian, Reign of the Old Ones. As we resume trying to make sense of this waking nightmare, now, when we left off last time, we had just started investigating the Arkham Stabber case, which seems to have led us straight to a restless spirit of some sort. So, against our better judgment, let's summon it up and see what it can tell us. Disturbs me. The ghost's aura emits a tangible sensation of angst and distemper. I said no rune service, shouts a hollow, trembling voice. What must a gentleman do to get some privacy? Who are you, spirit? No one. At least, no one of any caliber. Just a drunk, bankrupt businessman who is spending some time at a hotel in order to have some peace. A cold wind blows over your face. And you are ruining that exact moment of peace. I warn you, sir. Leave this room at once, or I'll make you leave. The dusty objects in the room begin to tremble of their own accord. Spirit, as your summoner, I, John Trench, bind you to this realm until you do my bidding. You observe the ghost sensing the power and truth of your words. Pushed around in life, pushed around thereafter. What do you require of me? He examines your clothes with distaste. You silly man. Scare the bastard next door, and you'll be free from my leash. The manifestation's ectoplasm, a byproduct of the summoning, thickens before your very eyes to an almost oozing viscosity. This I will do. But if you bother me with anything else, you shall learn what makes me a dangerous man. I had nothing to lose in life. I have nothing to lose now. Noted. Get to it. All right, let's see what that accomplished. This place is damned! And there goes the fearsome carry-on Jack. And here I was thinking I'd have to poison him. Well, let's have a look around. Should have plenty of time now. Coca Vin Marie. Interesting. Not the sort of thing we want to risk using if we can help it. There we go. Julian's crumpled note. Originally intended for Julian's fiancée, Maria, this unsent note documents the extent of the desperation which had overwhelmed the dead man after the Black Day. Alright, we'll have a look at that once we finish exploring the rest of the hotel. I think we're almost done now. This room is much cleaner and in better repair than the rest of the hotel. It doesn't take a detective to deduce that Edian makes this place his home. Well, I'm sure he won't mind if we have a quick look around. Hmm. A 
actually had the sense to lock up his valuables. Good for him. Raw opium. <laughs> he really didn't seem like the type, but um, we'll just take that for his own good. Okay, the stairs to the fourth floor are blocked, so I guess we're done here. At least for now. Actually, there is no fourth floor. That's, um, hmm. Well, I suppose Edian could be using too much opium. Or that's just cut content. Nothing new from Edian, so moving on. Now let's have a look at that note we found. My eternal light, Maria. My once thriving hopes have been dashed, leaving only despair. The shadow that devoured the city prevents us from reaching the outside world. We never should have come to this godforsaken place. I should never have said yes to this deal. Please know that I did everything to have a better life without... What the hell is the point? I've written the same things again and again, but none of my letters will ever leave Arkham. They lay unread in that damned post office, where they will stay forever. Oh, sweet Maria... I'm never going to see you again. Please forgive me. Hmm. Not a lot there we can use, but it does point us towards the post office. Although one of the newer buildings in town, the supernatural darkness has reduced the post office to decrepitude, interring the letters of the damned betwixt its cracked walls. Lovely. Well, let's have a look. Oh, that. That's a ghoul, and a bunch of dismembered lunatics. Well, I think we all know how this is going to end, but let's at least try to talk our way past them. You see a partly eaten, raving lunatic bow to a feral anthropomorphic creature with a filthy crown on its head. The demented man hysterically shouts at the wounded beast. Oh, savage one, bless us with your degradation! He passionately offers one of his surviving limbs to the bestial creature. Unmake the wicked civilization in us. Awaken us, your majesty, with the sweetest of pains. He turns suddenly to stare at you, as though he knew of your presence all along. Uh, I don't mean to interrupt, but... The lunatic howls dissonantly. Hear thee, hear thee! Our majesty's new jester hath arriven! Uh, let me just take what I need, and then I'll leave you alone with your majesty. Take something. But you've already stolen our hearts. The other lunatics fill the room with wacky applause. But let me teach you a trick, Jester. 
Everything is funnier when you spill the red juice. He raises his half-eaten arm. He turns and performs an obeisance to the creature he has taken for his king. Yes, your highness. The festivity shall begin at once. All the lunatics leap at you with gushing ecstasy. Yeah, that went about as well as we could have expected it to. Let's do this. Alright, the wounded ghoul is obviously our biggest threat here, but once we pick off his followers, we should be able to flank him safely. Nice, that's one down. Oh, uh, thanks, I guess. Though, you're in my way now. Hmm. Huh. Having some issues with the movement here. All right, that's fine. Now, I would like to kill this thing if possible, but I suppose we really just have to keep it busy. Yeah, let's have Trench go for those letters. Nice, and that's what we came for. Let's wrap this up. Oh, geez. That's what I get for pushing my luck. All right, let's see if we can salvage this. Oh, there we go. <laughs> well, that didn't go quite as planned, and we did gain our first level of angst, but all things considered, I think that could have gone a lot worse. All right, let's take a look at our options here. Any time now. There we go. Basically, angst is like the opposite of a level up. 
Instead of gaining a perk, you gain a defect, which is something that will just make your life a little more difficult moving forward. We'll need to make sure we pick something we can actually live with. We are going to get stuck with at least three or four of these by the end of the game. All right, let's go with Dependent. We haven't really needed much in the way of addictive substances just yet, so that should be fine. And let's see what else we've got here. Oh, actually, we need to stop that bleeding. There we go. Now we can have a look around. Hmm. More cigarettes. Always useful. Needs examination. The communication equipment scattered around these desks is all inoperative due to the power shortage, the absence of staff, and other vital deprivations. That's a very tactful way to put it. Got the letter, got some cigs. I guess that's it. My ever shining light, Maria. I am writing to you from a godforsaken town called Arkham. I don't doubt that you're upset about how we parted ways, but please, baby, let me explain. The reason why I left without so much as a goodbye is because you'd have never believed me if I told you about the crazy hit we set our sights on. But with God as my witness, we made it, Maria. We really made it this time. You can't even imagine what kind of digs we're in right now. A ritzy hotel suite. Who would have thought that the bedraggled Boston rejects would lodge at the fanciest hotels, eat the best meals, and guzzle the best hooch? Certainly no one would, about a week ago. I'm talking about gold, Maria. Real, glittering gold. From now on, I swear you'll never have to work another damn day for the rest of your life, so say goodbye to your mop and apron. Better believe it, baby. We're richer than the Rockefellers. Whatever kind of good-for-nothing lollygagger I was, you never gave up on me all these years, and for that, I'm eternally grateful. But know that your lover has struck gold this time. I mean, literally. I miss you, my shining angel. I'll be in your arms very soon. Julian Plover Well, that gives us some interesting backstory, and lets us know there's gold at the middle of this, but... It doesn't really give us any new leads.
All right. I guess we'll have to go talk to that detective next. You know what? We are right here, so let's have another chat with this guy. You again. What do you want now? Can't a man drink himself to death in peace? He slurps his moonshine, spilling some in his shaggy beard. I want to help you. If you really want to help me, then bring me a shot of Richter's morphine. <laughs> Listen, with my contacts, I can supply all kinds of dope, enough to last you a lifetime. But tell me what happened to you first. You're, you're quite the blag artist, aren't you? He clearly lacks the self-confidence to play hard to get. Oh, what the heck. I lost everything anyway. Might as well lose a few minutes to a story now. You just made a great decision. You're going to hear from me again, and soon. He wags his finger at you. You better, otherwise I'll come searching for you, and there's going to be hell to pay. He takes a deep breath and exhales slowly. It all began after I met Gwen Robin, my, um, former, <laughs> you know. Being a poor cobbler's son, I was obligated to put bread on the table, and that's why I joined the guard, for the extra pay ch check. Hailing from an even poorer Arkham family, Gwen was working as a wireless op operator at the base. Boy, who, she had it all. Blonde, nice figure. He continues with teary eyes. Oh, how I miss our little escapades. But everything went to hell when she had to quit her job due to some family issue back home. I was sh shaken and broken, but had to continue with my training, knowing not that the worst was yet to come. Then the footsteps of the apocalypse, cases of mass hysteria... Arson, mass murders, power shortages, you name it. The National Guard was called to active duty, and I was stuck being a full-time soldier. He licks his lips. As I was getting to the end of my rope physically, Gwen's last letter proved to be the final blow. She said we had to break up, that she couldn't never see me again. No reason, nor explanation. Nothing. He struggles to continue. The old Jeremy Parsons died then and there. But despite the pro profound sadness I felt, I forced myself to see her again one last time. So I just escaped the base by hiding inside an Arkham-bound logistics truck. Hmm. You abandoned your post, huh? So much for honor and duty. I did, and for that I will never forgive myself. I'm a scoundrel for turning my back on the proud inst institution of our forefathers who fought the Empire. How can I betray the legacy of the Minutemen? So, you still aspire to be a freedom fighter after all? He responds with a bitter heart. I could, if only we still had a country to protect. After coming to Arkham, I quickly realized that I had to avoid detection, so I disguised myself in civilian clothing and buried my uniform somewhere. Then I went straight to Gwen's address. There was nobody in the house. Even their coffee cups were on the table. But they were gone. It's as if she vanished, or never even existed at all. I lost track of her ever since. I asked around, but only met hostility and apathy. Oh, what a short-sighted fool I've been. He hangs his head in shame. I'm sorry about that, Jeremy. We've all experienced bitter loss. Still do. I hope you find her someday. 
you seem like a good man. Here, he hands you a picture of a blonde woman. This is Gwen. Will you ask around for her? Maybe you can do better than I, than I did. Sure, I'll do my best. Thanks, sir. Goodbye, Jeremy. Hmm. Gwen's photograph. Portrait of a young blonde woman, plainly dressed and posing chastely. Written on the back is, To my chic with love. Interesting. Well, we'll keep an eye out for her, but... I can't help but notice, nothing was actually added to our journal. Okay, so our next goal is to go talk to that detective, Detective Wilkins, I think. But I think we've also got enough loot here to purchase an extra relic or two. Let's pop into Honest Builds, sell off some of the stuff we don't need, and uh, then we'll run over to Isidore's, see what we can afford. After that, we should probably get some rest. Sonya's a little worse for wear after our run-in with that ghoul. Now let's see here. We can dump that chiv, and we're definitely not going to need those clothes either. I guess we can dump the needle and thread, too. That's only really useful if you have the survival skill, which we, of course, do not. We mostly just want SIGs, but we'll pick up a few supplies, too. We're good on rations. We'll just grab some camping supplies. We are going to need that toolbox too, but that's definitely a lower priority. Let's go see Isidore. Okay, now, that obviously bears investigating, but we're pretty light on sanity at the moment. I think we need to get some rest first. Steal our minds before we confront the unknown.
Oh, right. We can actually crack open this bus now. A police baton and a copy of Little Women. Interesting combo. can't go through the trap door anymore. I hope that's not permanent. All right, well, let's go talk to Isidore. Okay, now, that plus one to subterfuge could definitely come in handy. But I think we need to prioritize the plus one to psychology first. Oh, we've uh, actually got enough for both of them. Though, it wouldn't leave us with much left. Okay, here's what we're going to do. We'll go ahead and grab them both. Then we'll go rest and learn one of these spells. Then we can just sell the manuscript back to Isidore. The Pendulum of Miss Montford. Even though the famous hypnotist's secrets were thought to be largely uncloaked, it was in fact an ability of recognizing her client's psychological weakness that truly contributed to her miraculous seances. Malediction unknown. Abdul's Severed Hand. This ghastly skeletal hand is rumored to have belonged to Abdul Rasal a thief whose hands were severed for his violation of Sharia law. One should take care as to which pocket the hand is placed in. Hmm. I don't like the sound of that. Okay, well, we don't need to equip the hand immediately. We'll uh, only use that when we're cracking a lock or something. As for the pendant, we didn't really get much hint as to what its side effect might be. Hold on. Something just changed. Oh, I see. It reduced our maximum health. Alright, that means we can actually use it pretty safely outside of combat. Ah, right. Oh, shoot. It also reduces our current hit points every time we put it on. All right, we'll keep it equipped forever then. Anyway, let's go get some rest. We'll learn a new spell and uh, then we can sell the manuscript to Isidore. After that, maybe we'll go check out that glowing window. We've got plenty of options, but I think we'll start with Blood Circle. That one certainly sounds useful. And uh, we need to shore up our sanity, so we'll spend some time reading the Book of Law.
Then we'll have our companions get started on some research projects. Alright, Sonya. What can you do with these springs? Get some rest, heroes. Okay, looks like we learned how to make bandages. And recoil reducers. Intriguing. And we learned how to cast Blood Circle. Not bad. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Man prefers to aspire to non-entity than to not aspire at all. I am not afraid of storms, for I am learning how to sail my ship. An interesting cross-section of humanity. Recoil Reducer. This gadget dissipates the recoil generated from a firearm. It increases the shooting accuracy of the pistol or revolver it's installed on. Ooh, very nice. And the, uh, ingredients are pretty reasonable, too. Though it does look like we're going to need a toolbox to actually build them. Alright, we'll bump it up the list. Hmm, trapdoor is still inaccessible. That's annoying. That's one of the reasons we bought that lantern. Okay, that gets us out of the danger zone. Though, we do still have those safes at the bank. Hmm. You know what? We're almost out of time, so let's check this out first. We'll save the bank for next time. The heavily scarred man who was conducting the ritual abruptly turns to you, like a scared predator caught in a trap. Soon after, you come to realize this man must have been condemned to some kind of torture that ultimately crippled both his flesh and soul. After making a heathen hand gesture, the man speaks with a voice that can only be described as a disturbingly loud whisper. They sent you to bring me back, cult dog. They think Krog is still the easy meat he used to be. One step closer, and Barzel Tharg Anu shreds you into a thousand pieces. You can feel the ruinous power emanating from this broken man. Will you dare to summon a demon? Have you never been warned about the hazards? All that man ever did was cripple me, take away my potential, and reduce me to this. He looks at his abused and naked body, scarred everywhere with esoteric symbols. This husk. You think my infernal guest can do worse? Never mind my guest. You know what I'll do after I'm done with you. I'll send your charred corpse as a parting gift to your masters. 
so they can learn to leave Krog alone. The tortured man starts to make convulsed movements while whispering in an alien tongue. The rising tension in the air is undeniable. Stop, I serve no master. After a brief look of surprise, his pained eyes scan you cautiously. Make yourself known, or I'll let the black worms devour your eyes. Hey, I'm John Trench. No eating my eyes, all right? The man calling himself Krog tips his head to one side, as if listening to an invisible advisor. My guest does not see the mantle of lies on you. This means you may live for a few more minutes. For a few minutes? You'd think I would take the risk of letting you... Gah. All of a sudden, the man falls into violent spasms, seemingly the result of extreme pain. Ah! Are you all right? Ignoring you, Krog concentrates on breathing deeply for a while, before he can whisper again. I cannot let you go. No one seeing me on this side of the river may live. Krog winces again, as if the pain has just returned to show him it is not going anywhere soon. Look, you're in serious pain. I can bring you all kinds of sedatives. He takes a moment to weigh your offer. It is true that I need some supplies. And I wouldn't say no to a pipe full of opium. A cigarette wouldn't hurt either. You got one? Sure, here you go. He grabs the cig from you, lights it with the flickering flame of a ritual candle, and inhales deeply. Ah, the only thing I miss about America. Since I prefer not to leave the protection of my domain, a supplier could come in handy. He turns to a vacant corner of the room. What do you think, Barzal? The tortured man gets lost in a feverish discussion, only occasionally interrupted by a nod coming from his side. At last, he turns to you again. There may be a way. I'm listening. Varzel Tharganu knows an old curse. It is called Verba Derelicta. It was once used on spies and assassins as a precaution in case they got caught. The one who carries the Verba Derelicta cannot even mention the name of the caster. And if the cursed is pushed to their limits, as in an interrogation, they simply, he clears his throat, die. How reassuring. It was you who trespassed in our domain, and as your hosts, me and Barzel Tharganu have the final say. Cursed or dead. Come on, we can find another solution. While you're trying to talk some sense into the scarred man, he's already whispering in Magus Latin. Upon the touch of an ice-cold drop right in the middle of your forehead, you realize the curse has been inflicted. And have I told you the spell is also quite quick to cast? You see Krog smiling for the first time. But don't put on the sackcloth and ashes, my friend. We can be real allies now. And in time, you may discover that a warlock and a daemon can come very handy in a town that's gone to hell. We'll see. I am curious about some things, however. Krog seems to be in agony, and you're unsure if it's because of his reluctance to endure your questions, or a byproduct of his condition. Do you have any idea what this statuette represents? Krog examines the ages-old figurine. Of course. That is a representation of Cthulhu or the Grandfather, as the cult calls him. The sheiks of the cult have been telling us that they could feel its presence nearby. I even heard that a band of cultists actually saw his majesty in full glory 
rising on the horizon. I also heard that when they were found, almost all of them were dead, with smiles of awe permanently fixed to their faces. And they tell that the surviving acolyte was saying just one thing. Oh, beautiful doom. Well, that's something to look forward to. Who is this infernal guest? His name is Barzal Tharganu, and I advise you to address him by his true name. He is a guest in my domain, and also my only ally in this game of cat and mouse. Yeah, we probably shouldn't push that. Would you like to barter? Yes, as long as you have something to take my pain away. I had stolen some tomes and manuscripts from the cult before making my escape. Some of the volumes I've studied thoroughly and do not need any more. Alright, so... Krog is basically just a spell vendor. Though, I think we can actually find most of these spells out in the wild. Still, it is another useful source for selling some of the weird junk we find in our travels. Anyway, I think we're pretty much done with Krog for now, so I think that brings us to a pretty good stopping point. We'll hit the pause button for now, but we'll pick up here next time as we clear out the bank, meet with that detective, and resume our pursuit of the Arkham Stabber. See you then. Oh, and remember, although I do love playing Stygian, Reign of the Old Ones, you can find out more about the game by visiting the official website, the official YouTube channel, the official Facebook page, the official Twitter feed, or the original crowdfunding campaign over on Kickstarter. Links are in the description.